want to encourage you to get your Bibles out and turn to Numbers chapter 12, and for about the first 10 minutes of our sermon, you'll want that open. I'll tell you when you can close it. We are doing a series of sermons on what makes a difference between a winner and a loser. And we are in sermon number three, and this week we are studying Miriam and Aaron, but we're calling it Miriam's Big Mistake. Moses was sent to Pharaoh, and Aaron was his mouthpiece. And they came to Pharaoh, and they asked Pharaoh for permission to go three days' journey into the wilderness and worship Jehovah. And Pharaoh's response is, so you think you can take three days off of work? You're my slaves. You must not be, your burden must be too light. And so Pharaoh then increased the burden for these slaves and wouldn't let them go three days' journey into the wilderness. Now Moses had been sent by God to be the deliverer, but things got worse before they got better. And the people really began to murmur and complain and protest. Ultimately, God did exactly what God was going to do. He sent 10 plagues. And after those plagues, Pharaoh decided he would allow the people of Israel to go. And as the people of Israel left Egypt, the Egyptians gave them all their gold and all their silver and all their precious stones and prepared them for their journey to their new home. The Israelites ended up at the Red Sea, exactly where God wanted them. God told them to camp there. So they camped there. Why? God wanted to give the Egyptian army a chance to catch up. Pharaoh changed his mind, sent his army after them, told them it was time to bring those people back. When the Israelites found out about the Egyptian army coming, they began to panic, murmur, and complain, and God did exactly what God was always going to do. God opened up the Red Sea, dried up the land. The people of Israel walked across the dry land to the other side of the Red Sea. When they got over there safely, the armies of Egypt arrived. They saw the opening. They took a chance. They went out, and when they got into the middle of the Red Sea, you know what happened. God closed down the waters, and the entire Egyptian army was destroyed. And now the Israelites didn't need to worry about the Egyptian army coming after them ever again. Well, they were praising God for a while, but that didn't stop their complaining because a few days into the journey, the waters that they got to to drink from were bitter and they couldn't drink. And they murmured and they complained and they griped and they protested about being there. And God said, cut down a tree, throw it into the water. They cut the tree down, threw it in the water, and the water became sweet. People rejoiced and praised God. Then a few days later, they ran out of food. And then they began to murmur and complain and protest. We well, shouldn't have brought us out of Egypt. We ran out of food. What are we going to do? And God did exactly what God had planned to do all along. God sent manna from heaven. And they had manna in the morning and manna in the evening and manna in the middle of the afternoon. They had manna all the time. They were thrilled to death for a while. And then they ran out of water completely. And they murmured and they complained and they protested. You shouldn't have brought us out of Egypt. And God told Moses to go over and strike a rock. And Moses went over and struck a rock and water came out of that rock. And that rock followed them around the wilderness. The whole time they were in the wilderness, they never ran out of water from that point on. So the people praised God and rejoiced for a few days and then they complained some more. They were tired of manna in the morning and manna in the afternoon and manna at night. They wanted some meat. And you heard the story that was read in Numbers chapter 11. They were really bummed out, tired of manna. They wanted meat. So they tell Moses, we want meat. We want meat. Can you hear them? You know, there's silverware on the table. We want meat. We want meat. Give us meat. And, and Moses reminds God that there isn't enough meat if they slaughtered every sheep and all the herds and provided the meat for all those people they would run out quickly and God says that isn't a problem for me I'm God and God sends them quail there's so much quail that the, by the time they got finished eating quail after a few days 
Quail was coming out of their nostrils. Two million people, two million complainers, too many people who cannot seem to remember how great God is, and they're all complaining to Moses, and Moses is at his breaking point. And then Aaron and Miriam challenge him. And that's where we get to chapter 12. I want you to remember, Moses is at his breaking point. And Aaron and Miriam take him into the tent of meeting to have a conversation with him. And we pick it up in verse 1. It says this, Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked. Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. And then in verse 3 it says, Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. We stop at reading there, but don't shut your Bible. Miriam and Aaron begin to complain to Moses about Moses. They challenge him because he's married to a Cushite woman. She doesn't look like them, and she's not Jewish, and they pick on him. They criticize him. They argue with him, and I want you to notice in verse 3, it says, and Moses was the most humble person on the earth. You say, what does humble mean? The word humble means, and you ought to write it down, it means you don't take up your own defense. You don't take up your own defense. You let God take up your defense. When somebody criticizes what you do, you don't try to defend yourself. You let God take care of it. You trust God to deal with the accusations. That's what humility means. Now, the Hebrew word also means this. It means to be humbled. It means to be beaten down. It means to be at the end of your rope because of the circumstances that you're facing. And Moses was both at this situation, at this time. He refused to defend himself before Miriam and Aaron, and he was also beaten down. He was at the end of his rope. He was ready to die. And Miriam and Aaron attacked Moses with basically, who do you think you are? Now, let's just go back a little bit and look at Miriam. Miriam is Moses' sister. And if you go back about 80 years, she could say to Moses, Moses, I was there when you were born. All the midwives had been told by Pharaoh that they were to kill all the baby boys that were born, but uh, we, they didn't kill the baby boys. And, and you were born to your mom and dad, and they tried to keep you for themselves as long as they could, but it's hard to hide a little baby boy. He cries too much. He wants to run around. So we took the baby, you, Moses, and we made a basket. We put you in the basket, and we put you in the river and allowed the basket to drift down the water. And I, Miriam, I ran along the shore watching the basket, making sure that everything was going to be okay with you, that if the basket tipped over, I'd be there to put you back in the basket. And then I saw the basket get lodged in the reeds and the in the sea, and then I watched, and Pharaoh's daughter came out, and she found you in the basket. And so I went to Pharaoh's daughter, and I said, listen, the baby's going to need someone to nurse the baby, and I know a woman who could do that, and I brought your mother to you, and she nursed you, and I was there with her. We were in Pharaoh's court for a period of time until you were weaned. And Moses, you wouldn't even be alive if it wasn't for me. And by the way, Moses, God has used me to prophesy to his people. God to let me lead. And then there's Aaron. Aaron, wow, he could have easily said to Moses, Moses, you told God you had a speech problem, and your speech problem is very, very bad, and you can't say anything to any of the people of God or even to Pharaoh himself without me speaking for you. They couldn't listen. You'd stutter way too much. And Moses, by the way, I have been the one who has been carrying out these miracles that God wanted to perform. So who do you think you are? Why do you think you're so special? You ought to let us lead. Well, by the way, 
when they finally did get a chance to lead, they allowed the people to build a camp. They allowed the people to worship that camp. Great leadership, huh? But listen to what God says. Numbers chapter 12, verse 4 and following. And once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, come out of the tent of meeting, all three of you. So the three of them went out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud, and he stood at the entrance of the tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam. When the two of them stepped forward, he said, listen to my words. When there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, reveal myself to them in visions. I speak to them in dreams. But this is not true for my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? The anger of the Lord burned against them and he left them. And when the cloud lifted from above the tent, Miriam's skin was leprous. It became as white as snow. Aaron turned toward her and saw that she had a defiling skin disease. And he said to Moses, please, my Lord, I ask you not to hold against us the sin that we have so foolishly committed. Do not let her be like a stillborn infant coming from his mother's womb with its flesh half eaten away. So Moses cried out to the Lord, please, God, heal her. And the Lord replied to Moses, if her father had spit in her face, would she not have been in disgrace for seven days? Confine her outside of the camp for seven days. After that, she can be brought back. So Miriam was confined outside the camp for seven days. And the people did not move on till she was brought back. I love that passage of scripture. That settles it, God said. You just picture that? Yeah. Now listen. Moses isn't perfect, but Moses is chosen. And Aaron and Miriam's sin is one of rebellion. Yet Moses pleads with God to forgive them right in the middle of their coup attempt. He asks the question, why put this story in the Bible? Well, because the Bible tells us that the Old Testament stories are there for our benefit, they're there as an examples to us. They are warnings to us. They're there to show us who God is, who we are, and how God responds. They're there for our teaching, for our rebuking, for our correcting, and for our training in righteousness. So today we're going to dial in on Miriam and Aaron and ask, how could these two winners have become losers. What did they do to move from being a winner to being a loser? So we're gonna look at life lessons and we're gonna look at two poisons that will wreck a good thing. These poisons will destroy any marriage. It'll destroy a good job. These poisons will destroy a good church. These poisons will destroy good relationships. Poison number one is envy. Miriam and Aaron sipped from the cup of envy. They were saying, Moses, we know your flaws better than anyone else. Who do you think you are? We deserve as much responsibility and as much leadership roles as you have. Now, the source of envy is comparison. The result of envy Envy is grumbling, a lack of gratitude. That's what envy does. Envy causes us to compare with others, and then we grumble with what we don't have that they have, and we lose our gratitude to the blessings that God has already given us. And we've all been there. I said this before, I'll say it again. There are things that I never knew I needed until you got one. Hey, you got it. 
You were usually really thankful for our blessings until someone gets more blessings than we have and then we become envious. The moment we take our eyes off of our blessings and we put our eyes on their blessings, we begin to sip from the poison of envy and our gratitude for our blessings diminish. You gotta understand gratitude though. Gratitude isn't something that I show so that I get extra credit with God. Gratitude is the core of what it means to be living in the will of God. Uh, you have some references in your notes. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. I want you to read that to me. We're going to read it out loud. It begins with give thanks. Okay, I'll get you started, but I want you to read it. Ready? Give thanks. Okay, we're going to give, will, give thanks for all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for us, okay? Now, I gave you 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 and 12. Verse, uh, verse, I'm sorry, verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 10 and 11. Verse 10 has something to do with gratitude and grumbling. And verse 11 will let you know where I got that idea that all the Old Testament scriptures are given to us for our warning and examples. So I want you to read those two verses to me out loud. I'll get you started. It starts with, and do not. Okay, ready? And do not. Wow. You read that verse? You read that verse before, those two verses? You know, you grumble too much, God might kill you. You say, oh, no. Well, the verses, the stories are written for what? Examples and warnings to us? Okay. Envy kills gratitude. It kills the foundation of our spiritual life or the foundation that our spiritual life is built on. Now, what is that foundation? The foundation is Jesus Christ, who has forgiven all of our sin, who has adopted us into his family, who has made us a child of God, who has made us an heir of God, who has made us joint heirs with Christ. Okay, now let me ask you a question. If you are joint heirs with Christ, Everything that belongs to Christ belongs to, yeah, me, me, us. Everything that belongs to Christ belongs to us. We are joint heirs with Christ. Now, that is a lot to be thankful for, isn't it? That's why gratitude is so foundational. Isn't it interesting? We... Love to ask God to show us his will. We say, God, I need to know what your will is on this issue. Should I marry this person? Is that your will? Oh, God, is it your will that I take this job? God, is it your will that I play this sport? God, is it your will that I, that I should go to this college? What is your will? God's always glad that we're talking to him, wanting to know what his will is. But if I'm living in grumble land, if I am not a thankful person, if I'm not full of gratitude, I am asking, I am asking in vain when I ask for God's will on something. Because God will look at me and say, listen, I have written what my will is. My will is that you are thankful in all circumstances. You are not walking in thankfulness in all circumstances. You are disobeying my written will. Why should I let you know what my will is for your marriage, for your college, for your job, for your sport? If I've written it and you disobey it, what do I expect you to disobey it if I tell you? We need to be people of gratitude because then we can go to God and we can start asking him about all the other things that we have questions about. Now, the poison number two is this. It's the poison of pride. 
They were saying to Moses, who do you think you are? Do you think you're better than us? We want to be leaders also. Pride is that attitude that refuses to submit to the leadership that God has established. Not submitting is a telltale sign that we have sipped from the poison of pride. If we, re if we refuse to submit to those that God has put over us and we begin to look down on people, that is a sign that we've moved into pride. God says in the Old Testament that the number one sin that he hates is haughty eyes, which means pride. Haughty eyes is when you look down on another person who hasn't achieved what you've achieved and you think you're better than they are. Haughty eyes is when you look down on somebody who doesn't have what you have and you think you're better than they are. Haughty eyes is when you see somebody who has not grown as much as you have in your walk with God and you think you're better than they are, that is pride and that is a sin. So an unwillingness to submit to those in authority and looking down on others is a sign that we have sipped from the poison of pride. Now listen carefully. Moses was not perfect. Moses had a bad temper. Moses was not going to enter the promised land because he had disobeyed God. But Moses wasn't in the role of leadership because he was perfect. He was there because he was appointed, because he was chosen, because he was anointed by God to be the leader of those two million people and bring them from Egypt to the promised land. That is why Moses was in that position. I think as believers in Jesus Christ, we need to remember that God is in control of who is in control. You know, when I meet with the guys up there at the McDonald's in the morning and we start talking about politics and our president, I have to really watch my mouth because God is in control as to who is in control. There's no one that's in the position of authority that is not there by the hand of God. Listen to what Romans 13.1 says. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. You know, that includes all roles of leadership, local, regional, national, homeowners association, Leadership at work. All authorities are established by God. Now let me ask you a question. Is that statement confusing? No. It's pretty simple. They're in authority. They're established by God. Now, so we're to submit to those who are in authority. But that doesn't mean that we have to submit to them if they're asking us to violate the word of God and the will of God. Uh, the midwives who were delivering the Israelite babies have been told by Pharaoh to kill all the baby boys that were born. And the midwives disobeyed Pharaoh, and when they were asked about it, they lied about it. And God didn't get upset with them. When Rahab had two spies from Israel join her in her place, and she hid them, and then they went off, she was asked, where are those spies? And she knew that it wasn't God's will that they be put to death. And so she lied about it. She didn't submit to the authority there. So anytime we're asked to violate God's word and submit to an authority that's telling me to do something that God says don't do, I am not to submit to them. But other than that, I am to submit to all those that are in authority over me. I can vote them out of office, though. But while they're still in office, I need to submit. Now, once we start sipping from the two poisons of envy and pride, we're going to be in trouble with God. 
Now, for the next few minutes, I want to give you some, re some ways that we need to respond to others who have what we want so that we're not envious, okay? Here's number one. Remember that life is not fair, but heaven is better than fair. As a follower of Jesus Christ, we have not we have never been promised that life will be fair. But we are guaranteed that heaven will be far better than fair. Listen to Matthew 19, 29. Everyone who has left houses and brothers and sisters or fathers or mothers or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. Now, a hundred times as much in eternal life, that's good enough for me. But a hundred times as much is not promised me in this life. I could show you hundreds, maybe thousands of people who left their families, left their houses, left the land that they had, went off to a foreign field, became missionaries in an area, ministered to people out there and died and never saw this promise come true in this life. But guess what? When they get to heaven, heaven will be far better than fair. And there they will receive a hundred times as much plus eternal life. Fair here? Not necessarily. Fair later? You bet, and far better. Now here's a problem with human nature. I experienced something that is seemingly unfair, and I say, where is God in this? And I understand that. Something comes into our life and it hurts us deeply. It is unfair. It's not happening to everybody else. It seems as I'm being hit by being picked on. Where is God in this? And what we're doing is we're judging God's goodness and his power and his justice by what happened today. You gotta write this down. Never judge God's goodness or God's power or God's justice on today's happenings. Judge him by the cross. That's where true goodness is. That's where the true power was to bring forgiveness to all of our sin. That's where justice was, where the holiness of God was meted out Blame sin for the injustice. Blame sin for the rebellion. Rebellion and injustice will be here till heaven shows up. Yeah, I want fair, but life isn't fair. But heaven is going to be far better than fair. Oh, by the way, you really don't want fair. You really don't want fair. When you stand before Jesus, in heaven, I doubt there's one of us that will say to God, give me what I deserve. We don't want fair. We don't want fair. We're going to stand before God and we'll say, I'll accept your grace. I'll accept your mercy. I'll accept your forgiveness. We're not going to demand fair. Number two, nothing is as good or as easy as it looks. You know, when you see the blessings in someone's life, you don't normally see the weeds that are in their life. You don't see the toilets that they're scrubbing. It always looks better over there. You get a promotion that you've always longed for, and then you discover it's not as awesome as you thought it was. To borrow a statement from Robert Schuller. He said, bloom where you're planted. Number three, we'll never lead well if we haven't learned to follow well. A servant leader will put the needs of others as more important than their own needs. But servant leadership never begins when you start leading. 
It starts when you're serving the leader. If you can't serve well and you can't follow well, you will never lead well. You need to study Daniel's life and Joseph's life. Two men, they were taken by others and put in a position of some form of captivity. Yet where they were, they served God well and served those that were around them well. And God elevated them. And then when they got into those positions, people turned on them and people rejected them. And they ended up being thrown into a lion's den or being thrown into prison. And where they were, they served God well and God elevated them. And all of a sudden, at the end of uh, when God was done testing them and trying them and they came forth as gold, they were found themselves in positions of leadership over nations that they were part of. Study it. It will help you understand what it means to have a servant's heart. And number four, the difference between envy and contentment is what we focus on. Uh, listen to Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 to 13. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Let me give you my definition of contentment. Contentment means I've learned to cope, period. I've learned to cope, period. I've learned to cope when I have less than I think I need. I've learned to cope. But how do I learn to cope? Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Now, this doesn't mean you put blinders on and you ignore the problem. Go ahead and admit that there's a problem, admit there's a challenge, but then go back and focus on things that are right and noble and pure and lovely and admirable, things that are excellent, things that are praiseworthy. And as you begin to focus on those things, God will touch your heart and enable you to sit back and be content whether or not you have everything you want or you have less than you think you need. And you will cope well. Now, I want to give you an assignment. It's a 30 to 60 day assignment. I expect everybody to do this. I am going to do it. Hopefully you will do it. Now, if you are a writer, you like to jot things down, you're artistic, that type of thing. What you want to do is you want to go get yourself a journal. And I want you to begin today or tomorrow to write down everything that God has, every blessing God's given you. Just write them down. You say, I got a great wife, I have a great house, I have a great job, I have a great dog. You know, I got some money in the bank, I got my bills are paid, just write those things down. Everything you're blessed God for, day one, okay? Day two, I want you to write down everything God's blessed you. Now, but don't write down the things he blessed you with on day one, okay? You've got those things down there, he still blessed you with those things. Add some new things. What came into your life today that God blessed you with? Write down those blessings. Keep a journal for the next 30 to 60 days of all the blessings that are coming in your life. I promise you it will change your attitude of gratitude because you will see that God is blessing your life on a daily basis. Now, for those of you who say, oh, I hate to write, Ooh. then this is what I want you to do. Go on a daily walk. I'll call it a walk of blessings. On your first day out, list all the things that God has given you. God, you've given me a great wife, and she has all these great qualities. You've given me a great job, and this is why I'm blessing you for that. And, you know, and write it all down or talk about it to God. The next day, go on your walk again and start blessing him for new blessings in your life. Day three, bless him for additional blessings in your life. Do this for the next 30 to 60 days and see what God will do as he changes your focus. I promise you, it'll make a huge difference in all of our lives. 
I'd love to be able to tell you I'm going to collect your journals, but I'm not going to do that for you. But in about 30 to 60 days, I'm going to ask you for some testimonies of how God used that exercise to bless your life. We don't have time to sing this morning, so let's stand and be dismissed with prayer. After we're done praying, if you have a need, whatever that need may be, we'll have some prayer teams up front that are willing to pray with you about anything. If you're here this morning, you say, you know, I don't really know much about this Jesus guy. I'd really like to have a relationship with God. If Jesus is the way, can somebody help me? Anybody that's up here will be delighted to share with you and help you in your walk to coming right with God through faith in Christ. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'll help us as your people to realize that envy and pride are poisons that will destroy any relationship. It'll destroy a marriage. It'll destroy relationships. It'll destroy churches. It'll destroy anything. Lord, if we wrestle with envy, if we wrestle with pride, may we do what has to be done. May we drop on our knees before you today and let you know that we acknowledge that we have this problem, that we're sipping from some poisons that need to be taken care of. And may we not get off our knees until you have cleansed us from that sin, those sins, until we know that you have said to us, okay, now get up and go forth and serve me and sin no more. And Lord, if we struggle with that, after we do that, may we seek somebody out and ask them to hold us accountable, to talk to us, are you still struggling? And may we find help with each other. So Lord, may we walk away from these sins by confession, by receiving forgiveness, by being cleansed, and by finding somebody that will walk with us until that sin is driven from our life. We don't want to be winners right now and then end up losers. No, we want to be winners all the time. So Lord, may we take advantage of what we heard. May your spirit breathe life into the words that I have just spoken. May your spirit breathe life into the words that we've heard today. And we pray this in Christ Jesus' name with thanksgiving.